crossovers, what can you say about them? Love them or hate them, video game crossovers are always interesting to witness, just to see how two different franchises would mix with each other, even if the result can end up being pretty good, to sometimes being a disaster. And the Fire Emblem crossovers are especially interesting to look at, since they're probably not what most fans expect when they see the end product. Of course, the crossover title that I'm talking about is namely the Shin Megumi Tensei X Fire Emblem and Fire Emblem X Warrior crossovers. To say that the Shin Megumi Tensei crossover got mixed reception within both the Fire Emblem and SMT community would be an understatement, though I have no underlying thoughts on that crossover since I never played it. But the crossover that I do want to talk about is the Fire Emblem and Warrior crossover since it's a crossover that I did play. So how does it fare as a crossover then? Does it do justice to both series? Is it as mixed as the more fervent fans of the series say it is? Does it live up to the standards of the other Warrior crossovers? Well, that's what I'm here to discuss. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my review of Fire Emblem Warriors. Fire Emblem Warriors is a hack and slash slash beat em up that was developed by Omega Force and published by Nintendo. It is available on the Nintendo Switch and the new 3DS. The footage you'll be seeing in this review is on Nintendo Switch and in performance mode. Also do note that I'll only be reviewing the base game with no DLC. Come on, Crom. I mean, we've got to do something. What do you propose? Huh? How should I know? Ugh. I see you're awake. That was a nasty fall you took. Can you stand? Thanks a lot. But who are you guys? Visually, I say the game looks decent on the Nintendo Switch. It's not the best looking game out in the Switch by far, but the character models actually look pretty nice with the cell shading they implement, with doing the art style that these characters originate from justice. Whether you like Awakening or Fate's art style though is another matter. But suffice to say that the cell shading and character models do look rather nice if you did like the character designs from both those games. The animation is also very over the top from the crazy horse acrobatic you see Xander do in his combos to Lin over the top swordplay that gets her to zip around the battlefield essentially in a blink of an eye. The animation is really a sight to behold and are really invigorating to witness during gameplay. It never really got old to me to see these animations. The particle effects are also really nice to see. The sore spots in the visuals is probably the textures and the environment. The environment can be pretty drab at times, with there not being too much variety between them, with the textures looking off at times as well. The lighting can also look odd during certain angles. But still, I wouldn't say that Fire Emblem Warriors is an awful looking game, even with those noticeable issues. It still looks nice in motion, with it really emphasizing the over the top action to suck you in. The cell shading doing a good job in portraying the art style of the Fire Emblem games that this game represents, well, for the most part. In the overall scheme of things, the game looks decent. Not great, but also not god awful. Now do note this is based on the Nintendo Switch version, so I have no idea how the 3DS version of the game looks. Sound design wise, it's done pretty well. The sound effects for one sounds like they should, with it overall doing a good job of amplifying the over the top action. The Fire Emblem S sound effect found in the game is also a very welcome addition. From hearing the level up sound effect, whenever one of your playable characters gain enough experience to level up, ha, now I can do even more. to how a specific history mode map has the menu sound effect from a Fire Emblem game that particular map is influenced by. The sound effect they were able to get from the Fire Emblem series really does help immerse itself into thinking that you are playing a game that is playing homage to the Fire Emblem series, which is what a crossover should do essentially. Now let's talk about the soundtrack. The soundtrack of this game is comprised of original tracks that is made for this particular game, as well as numerous remakes of tracks that was in Awakening, Fates, and Shadow Dragon. The original tracks by themselves are okay. They're not too memorable, but they don't detract you from the game. The remix tracks though, well, this game remix tracks follow pretty much the same pattern of other crossover Warrior Games Remax tracks. Which is to say they added electrical guitar for most of the tracks and tried to give the tracks more of a rock stylings to it. And I have to say it works pretty effectively. I'll bet some tracks work better with the stylings like the Chaos track from Awakening 
But none of the tracks I felt were bad just because they were trying to adhere to the Coel style of music. The music at the end of the day is bombastic and really gets you pumped up as you play through the game with each map tracks, also smartly having a calm version and battle version, which you hear whenever you switch between fighting in real time or pausing the game in the map screen. Which is again giving homage to the Awakening and Fates musical style of how they had a calm version and battle version of each map theme that allowed those games to have music that was distinctive but also immersive. The voice acting is okay. It's not horrible but it's not the best thing. Coming from Shadows of Valentia it is a step down but it's nowhere near the level of Telius' voice acting. It's not nearly as awkward or wooden. Though I do find it jarring that some characters' voices sound different from the game that they originate from. Now let's talk about the story and characters of the game. Story-wise, the game takes place in the kingdom of Atolis, where you play as the royal heirs of the kingdom, which is namely Rowan and Diana. All is peaceful until one fine afternoon, mysterious portals appear, with it bringing a mysterious force of monsters that has attacked the capital. Unable to hold the capital, Rowan and Lyanna reluctantly flee the capital and thus begins their journey of trying to find a means to beat back this monstrous tide. And along the way, heroes from VR's Fire Emblem games will mysteriously appear and join them to defeat the great evil that has appeared. Well, namely characters from Awakening and Fates, as well as a bit from Shadow Dragon. Overall, the story isn't that good. It's pretty bad, actually. Though it's bad in a way that most crossover games are, and that it's basically just an excuse to get various main characters from a franchise to work together toward defeating a greater evil. With this evil in the game being an evil dragon, which isn't that much of a surprise if you play Fire Emblem. But yeah, the story really does feel hastily put together. It's just an excuse to make these different characters from different games to work and interact with each other, with how underdeveloped the original part of the game is. The main OCs for one are underdeveloped with their personality traits being pretty tropey, with Rowan being your standard Lao Shonen protagonist with nothing to let him stand out, and Liana is equally as stock too, with her being the more mature sibling that seemingly got her act together, but also hesitate more due to overthinking. Again, the stock sister archetype to go along with the hot-headed Shonen protagonist archetype. There's really nothing to let them stand out, and they don't develop much throughout the story, so you won't really care much about them, or at least I didn't. Though I will say that I do like their interaction with each other as siblings. How they interact with each other really do feel like they are brother and sister, which can be fun to watch. But yeah, the main OCs are pretty underdeveloped and underwhelming for the most part. The world is equally as underdeveloped as well, with it just being a generic medieval kingdom, without there being any substance to differentiate it from other medieval kingdoms that can be found in numerous media. The crossover characters also aren't used in interesting ways, besides them just helping the OCs so that they can return to their world. Overall, the story is pretty much your standard crossover story, which is to say it's pretty bad, with the story just being there to get a bunch of Fire Emblem characters from Fates, Awakening, and Shadow Dragon to come together. That and shoehorn as many memorable scenes from Awakening and Fates within this game's story. Though that's not to say there's nothing enjoyable about the story part of the game, because there is. Well, just mostly one aspect of it, that being the history mode reenactments you see when you progress through the map found in history mode. These reenactments are just really fun to see, with how they're acting out past scenes in various Fire Emblem games that the history mode maps are based on, which is great fan service. Additionally, the fact that they got the current cast of characters to act out other character roles in these scenes, such as Kaida acting out Florina bits during the Kaelin storyline, can be pretty fun to see at times too, just to see the juxtaposition between the original character role and the character they got to act out said original role. But still, overall the story is pretty bad. But its ban is a something that you pretty much expect since it's a crossover game. Albeit there are a few crossover game stories that I thought were pretty decent, but the rest I played are pretty plain bad, and Fire Emblem Warriors does lie on the plain bad side. But now let's address the elephant in the room. The one element in the story and characters that got the Fire Emblem community up in arms about this game, even before it got released, and that has to be the characters that are from the mainline Fire Emblem games. Oh, not because they're misrepresented in the game, 
I say they're presented well enough that the characters they took from Awakening, Fates, and Shadow Dragon still feel like the characters from their respective game and this game, more or less. I even think the characters got some pretty nice character interaction in the form of support conversations that are generally fun to listen to, either they be heartfelt moments or just really funny scenes altogether. Though I will say, there's not as much support combos in this game, since there's only one support conversation that happened between a pair of characters when they reach max spawn support. But the offset to that is that the support conversations themselves are pretty long, and I do think the support conversations do cover all the bases they need to. So yeah, the characters aren't misrepresented, and the actual interaction themselves isn't half bad. So what's the problem? It's not so much the execution of integrating these characters into the game, but the actual Fire Emblem games that the developer chose to represent in this crossover. In other words, the thing that got some Fire Emblem fans upset is how a good amount of games in the series aren't represented at all. At best, Warrior represent like 5 games which are namely Awakening, Fate, Shadow Dragon, Blazing Sword, and Echoes, slash Shadow of Valentia. But let's be real, it's namely just 3 games since Lin and Selikar are the only characters that are from Blazing Sword and Gaiden respectively, and even then, they don't even have a role in the main story, though they do have support convos with some other characters. And even then, Shadow Dragon kinda got the short end of the stick with it only having 3 characters. Though the list of playable Shadow Dragon characters do include Tiki, who's probably one of the most fun characters to play as, so it might balance itself out. But yeah, a crossover game that essentially represents 2-3 games in the series as like 12 original games, excluding the remix, is probably going to piss off the fans, since that's nowhere near adequate representation. And to make matters worse, the game represented in this crossover is predominantly Awakening and Fates, which is really overexposed at this point, which makes the people who hate those games, and who is really hoping that the older games will have representation, to be even more ticked off. Now, I don't have a hate boner for Awakening and Fates like some of the more extreme Fire Emblem fans do. Hell, Conquest is one of my favorite Fire Emblem games period, with how brilliant its overall design is as a SRPG. But I do think that Awakening and Fates is pretty overexposed now, not only with this game, but with the other Fire Emblem spin-offs, well namely Fire Emblem Heroes and the SMT crossover. Now I don't play Fire Emblem Heroes, but I do have friends that do, so I'm pretty well informed with the characters that are in the game. And let's just say there's a lot of variation of Awakening and Fates characters in that game. So yeah, I can get why people are sick with Fates and Awakening, even though I do get sick with the hate as well. But overall, the roster choice is a misstep. But let me get this clear. It's a misstep because we're only essentially getting 3 games worth of representation within this Fire Emblem crossover. It's not a misstep just because Awakening and Fates were the games that were represented. Some of those wondering why I need to make this distinction, and that's because I feel like there are some people in the fanbase who would say this game would be better if they represented different games, which is pretty misguided and really missing the main point. It doesn't matter if it represents your least favorite Fire Emblem game. What does matter is that it doesn't represent enough Fire Emblem games in the end. Albeit Fire Emblem as a series is pretty hard to represent sufficiently in a Warriors crossover game, just because of how many characters there are in each game, as well as the nature of how combat in the Fire Emblem series revolve around item management, with it being an SRPG, which in turn can make it kind of hard to make unique movesets for each character. But that doesn't really change the fact that the game does only represent a meager 3 games in this long standing series. Now to get to the gameplay of Fire Emblem Warriors, let's first talk about the structure of the game. Structurally, Fire Emblem Warriors followed the standard formula of the usual Warriors title, with there being a main story mode to play through as well as history mode, which is honestly where the bulk of the gameplay is. The main story mode is split between various chapters, with each chapter having you to partake in a battle in order to progress, with you seeing story at the start and end of each battle, most of the time. History mode is a mode that interestingly replicates various story beats from the Fire Emblem games that this game does represent, in the form of a map that you have to progress through, with you having to fight in numerous battles 
to fully progress and complete these maps, with battles falling within certain mission types, with the rewards for doing them ranging from various weapons to upgrading materials, with you also seeing cute reenactments of the story that these maps are based off with the cast of this game. Lastly, I'll talk about the battle prep menus. There's a convoy system which is pretty much an inventory system, with you being able to equip characters with a primary weapon as well as healing items or staves, with you being able to hold up to 100 items per category with this inventory system, with any access needing to be sold off. And then there's the camp section, which is split into the crest market, smithy, temple, and training ground. The crest market is basically where you use the various materials you get from battle to upgrade your character's efficiency, from unlocking their combos to allowing them to use higher rank weapons. The smithy is where you can modify the weapons you get as well as sell them. Temple is where you can get blessings to increase drop rates at the cost of some materials, and the training ground is where you can spend gold to increase your character levels. Overall, the structure of the game works well enough for what the game is going for. It's simple, but that simplicity allows you to go straight into the bulk of the gameplay, which is to say the combat, without much hassle, as well as giving you a clear indication of how to progress through both story and history mode. There's also a variety of mission types in history mode, which ranges from defeating X number of enemies in a certain time frame, to defeating boss type characters in the map, with the key being completing the side missions and make things easier or even doable in some cases, having only certain type of units to participate in a battle, and etc which overall changes how you progress through each battle. These different mission types really do help differentiate the type of battles you're going to get into, with the mission types being different enough for each other that does make it feel like you're not doing the same thing over and over again, and therefore won't reach burnout as fast as you think, but not so drastic as totally changing how the core game plays like. The rewards you get from these battles are usually pretty substantial as well, with the higher tier missions really do feel rewarding, with how much the reward can change up the gameplay, like having a master seal or getting a reaver weapon. The user interface for the most part is also decent. I do think it's annoying how you can't access the camp menu seamlessly when you're preparing how to position your units right before a battle starts, unlike the convoy system, with you having to essentially get out of the battle, go to the camp menu, and then select that battle again once your camp menu business is done. Though this might be a nitpick since the time having to go through the camp menu and then selecting the battle again, is pretty negligible, but it's still annoying having to go through multiple load screens rather than seamlessly having access to your camp menu like with the convoy system. But besides that, I don't really have any complaints with the user interface system in this game as far as structure goes. Everything is laid out pretty simple and clearly, which allows you to use these menus for their intended purposes without much hassle, which is what a good user interface system do. Well, if there is one thing I have to complain about, I will say that the requirements to getting an S rank can be a little misleading, but at least in terms of how many KOs you actually need to get it. Because the game will tell you that you need around 2000 KOs to get an S rank, but what the game won't tell you is that that 2000 KO count is just KOs that all your party members need to accumulate, and that your ally character's KO counts, when the AI controls them, do count towards the 2000 mark. You don't need to get your personal KO count to 2000. You can see the overall KO count on the map screen, so you easily know when to end the battle. Now let's get into what you'll be doing for most of the game, which is to say the combat. The combat is what you expect from a warrior's game, with you basically taking control of one of the many playable characters in the game to hack and slash through the numerous peons that stand in your way, as well as defeating enemy officers and achieving various objectives within the battlefield to be able to progress through each battle, and feeling invincible as you do it. Not to mention, you got a slew of characters to play around with, a decent amount of them having their own unique moveset. Granted, there are quite a few characters that have cloned moveset as well, but we'll talk about that later. But that's just a general outline of the combat, let's now dive deeper into the combat mechanics. Now like I said before, you'll be able to take control of one of the many playable characters in the game, with said character having a bunch of combos that you're able to utilize to decimate a group of enemy peons that stand in your way, or for enemy officer duels. Though there are characters in the game that are better suited for one or the other, but most of the characters still have moves that generally encompasses both. Just some characters are better suited for AoE type of situations or for enemy officer duels. But alongside the combos and powerful Muso attacks, which are basically AoE type of attacks that they can do if they got a filled warrior gauge, 
there are other types of mechanics to consider. For one, there's a weapon triangle system that's pretty much influenced by the weapon triangle in the Fire Emblem series, but how it functions is very reminiscent to the Heaven, Man, and Earth mechanic that was in Dynasty Warriors 8 mixed with the weak point gauge system from Hyrule Warriors. It's basically a mechanic that allows characters with a certain weapon type to have an advantage against other units with a specific weapon type, while having a disadvantage against units with another weapon type. In Fire Emblem Warriors case, characters who use the swords have an advantage against axe units, axe units having an advantage against lance units, and lastly, lance units having an upper hand against sword units. So yeah, the weapon triangle system in Fire Emblem in general. Albeit not every character in this game falls within the weapon triangle system, since some units use bows and magic, which doesn't have a weapon triangle system in place and have their own intricacies. But let's get back into the weapon triangle. Now to talk about the weapon triangle system fully in terms of how it functions, I'll have to talk about the stun gauge, which is basically this game's version of the weak point gauge from Hyrule Warriors. How it works is that it's a gauge that allows you to deal a particularly strong attack against a unit if you're able to fill that gauge, but know that the gauge only appears when doing certain combos or waiting till an enemy officer finishes his combo and then you counter attacking him, with you having to deal consecutive attacks in a combo to fill up that sound gauge. So how does the weapon triangle system factor into this? Well the weapon triangle system not only let you deal more damage to an enemy unit they have advantage against, but also amplify the stun gauge mechanic, with it allowing you to fill up the stun gauge mechanic much more quickly. And the attack that you get from a stun gauge when you have a type advantage is also a lot more powerful compared to filling a stun gauge when there is no type advantage. And oh yeah, filling a stun gauge while you have a type advantage also allows you to fill up your awakening gauge, which allows you to go into awakening mode if you have enough, which is like Musou Rage from the Dynasty Warrior game, with it being a mode where you not only deal more damage, but you basically have a type advantage against everything, which means you can do stun gauge buildup and attacks much more easily and can do a lot of damage with it. But how about if you have a disadvantage then? Well, you do reduce damage, as well as the stun gauge not really appearing much. Not to mention that if you get your allied AI to fight against a unit that they're weak against, it's probably not going to go well. Speaking about allied AI, you are also able to order where your allies go in the field using the map menu with you being able to dictate what type of units they can fight or even what type of forts they can take over, as well as doing defensive orders such as defending an ally or fort, with you being able to see what enemy types they would do well against or poorly against. Not to mention, you can also select 4 core characters that you'll be able to control and swap to during the battle. Like for example, say you took control of Krom at the start of the fight and then ordered Frederick to go north to a fort. Say some time passed and the AI control Frederick actually managed to take over the fort. Now if you swap to Frederick, you'll be where to control AI Frederick is and be able to control him, with Krom now being controlled by the AI. So basically, it's like the system from Samurai Warrior Chronicles, with how you got 4 characters you can swap to during the course of a battle. Now the next big mechanic to talk about is the parrot mechanic. Now the parrot mechanic is basically a system that, well, as the name implies, allows you to pair up characters with one character being the main attacker and the other being there for support, with the support unit basically being like a backpack unit, with how they kind of disappear from the field in order to aid your main attacker, so like in Awakening and Fates. Anyway, with the parrot mechanic, you will be able to get an assist attack, which will expose the enemy stun gauge and assist defend through the support unit, though there is a cooldown after you use them. You'll also be able to switch between which character is the main attacker, so you'll be able to have access to possibly two different movesets and weapon types on the field. And lastly, you'll be able to do a dual muso attack if both characters have a field warrior gauge. Well, that's overall how the combat works. So how does the overall implementation of the combat fares as a crossover title between the Warrior and Fire Emblem franchise? It actually works really well. Kind of me surprised. When I first heard there was going to be a Fire Emblem and Warrior crossover, I didn't think they would be able to translate the Fire Emblem gameplay elements well into a Warriors game. I was just expecting it to play like a standard Warriors title but having Fire Emblem characters. But lo and behold, they managed to take past mechanics from past Warrior titles and implement them in a way that make these mechanics feel like Fire Emblem as well as making sure that these mechanics don't take away from the Warriors gameplay. Rather, they actually add to the gameplay and make this Warriors game distinct from the other Warriors title, despite this game, for the most part, not having any new mechanics. Yeah, for the most part, to a Warriors fan, 
These mechanics have been seen before, but it's the way how this game combined past mechanics together and make it fit within the Fire Emblem theme that make this game shine. Such as putting in the Heaven Man Earth mechanic in the game, and repackaging that mechanic to fit the Fire Emblem theme, a la the Open Triangle, and allowing that mechanic to complement the character ordering system. These mechanics together really do give the game that SRPG and Fire Emblem feel, with not only how you can order units around, but there's also being a system in place to make you think on how to use the ordering system to its fullest via taking advantage of the Weapon Triangle system and ordering your units to fight against enemy units you know they would do well against. Add in other strategy-like elements to give you a variety of ways to tackle the battle, such as how mages can decimate units with lower resistance, and there being weapons with special properties that can decimate specific units such as horse layers, and you really do feel that you are commanding an army like an SRPG, with it being satisfying to do so with how there's incentive to utilize these mechanics well, which is how powerful they are when used right, but there's also being a variety on how to order your units to take down the enemy, whether that be taking advantage of the weapon triangle, or using mages to tackle down units that have low resistance, or taking down mages with Pegasus Knights, and etc. It just feels so satisfying to actually see the character you order around actually be able to hold their own due to you putting thought on that unit characteristics and thinking on how they should maneuver based on said characteristics. And it feels satisfying because they can only do that well due to your input since if left to their own devices, they probably wouldn't be able to do nearly as well. But at the exact same time, these strategy light elements doesn't take it too far that it negates the beat em up style gameplay that the warrior games are known for. There's incentive to use the SRPG light mechanics to its fullest, but it's still simple enough that you'd be able to execute these mechanics rather quickly so you won't be spending a lot of time going through menus, which is also helped by the user interface. The bulk of the gameplay is still in the beat em up combat, with the SRPG light mechanics allowing you to feel like you are managing an army, which does break up the beat em up combat in a good way since there is thought put into how you should use these SRPG light mechanics to fully benefit your allies, with the payoff being great. Again, not a whole lot of intricacies with these SRPG light mechanics for it to stand on its own, especially with how limited the map design is compared to a normal SRPG, as well as the Fire Emblem mechanic themselves just being more strongly suited for a turn-based game rather than a game with real-time combat, with the methodical unit placement not being nearly as emphasized in this game with how easy it is for your units to simply retreat if you do a bad move, where in a mainline Fire Emblem game, you probably lose that unit. But, this is a big but, there's still enough in there to make the SRPG like mechanics to feel like an engaging mechanic to partake in along with the beat em up action. Another example of how Fire Emblem Warriors managed to combine past mechanics to fit the Fire Emblem theme and make that mechanic add to the Warriors gameplay is how to combine the weak point gauge from Hyrule Warriors with again the weapon triangle system, with this directly influencing the beat-em-up action in satisfying ways. For one, I think having the stun gauge directly linked with the weapon triangle does greatly emphasize the significance of the weapon triangle, since the payoff of utilizing that mechanic is now properly manifested in a satisfying way, with not only having the stun gauge to be filled more easily by taking advantage of the weapon triangle, as well as witnessing the absurd amount of damage you can do with it, as well as the animation resulting from a stun gauge attack being enjoyable to see. Just so fun to pull off, especially with that critical sound effect that comes along with it, which as a Fire Emblem fan, is just awesome fan service. Combine this with the fact that fighting in a disadvantaged weapon triangle can severely limit the damage you can do, as well as you being prone to more damage, and the weapon triangle and stun gauge system overall is a great mechanic to encourage you to bring a balanced team set in terms of weapon types, which in turn can encourage you to play with many more movesets rather than just one, which can really add a lot of enjoyment and some variety to the combat. This aspect of the combat is further amplified with the character switching mechanic, which overall can reduce the chance of burnout from just using one character over and over again. I also like how characters who have weapon types outside of the weapon triangle is given their own intricacies in terms of how to integrate the stun gauge within their toolset such as archer units like Sakura Takumi having a charge mechanic to their movesets, with the type of stun gauge they have being determined by how long they charge up their charge attack, or mage units having to build up a gauge to build up via attacking, with them having to decide when is the right time to unleash the attack that allows them to force a stun gauge, which allows them to be more precise when they want to do a stun gauge attack, and etc. The way how the game integrate the stun gauge mechanic to characters whose weapons are outside of the weapon triangle system is pretty well done, with each of these weapon types 
feeling distinct in how they utilize their stun gauge, which can make them pretty fun to play. The last thing I'll probably talk about in regards to the stun gauge and weapon triangle system, well mostly the stun gauge, is that I do like how more offensive based the stun gauge is compared to Hyrule Warriors weak point gauge mechanic, where in Hyrule Warriors, the, the weak point mechanic it really revolves around playing defensively and waiting for an opening. The fact that the stun gauge can appear both offensively and defensively in Fire Emblem Warriors really does help with the flow of the game to go faster with, if you use it right. So in the end, the stun gauge of Weapon Triangle and how they are, are executed as well as how they are linked together really does overall add a lot to the gameplay as well as making it distinct from the other Warriors titles. There's also the pair up system which I think is pretty fun to utilize. I do like all the neat and powerful things you can do with the system, from something minor such as getting bonus stats, getting assist defend, to something much more substantial like being able to assist attack to open up a stun gauge, being able to essentially combo cancel with the system by character swapping when you're in an animation which will allow you to extend a combo as well as allowing you to have access to a second moveset, and being able to use dual specials which are especially devastating. Using the pair up system just feels powerful with the tools that becomes available to you. I also think it's neat that you are also able to pair up with characters that are green allied units, with that also having its own rules with how you can't switch to a green allied unit, with them being there to only boost your stats and doing assist attack and assist defend. Pair up overall is a lot of fun to use and is a powerful and more importantly interesting mechanic to play around with in terms of the tools that becomes available to you. Now let's talk about character movesets. Since that plays a big part if a warrior's game, it's going to be fun. Well, how a character plays like in general is a big determining factor if an action game is fun or not, but I digress. The character movesets in this game, for the most part, is pretty good. Like I said, Tiki is probably the best design character in terms of movesets, with how her entire kit revolves around building up and using her Wicked Gauge to transform, to deal a ton of damage, with it contrasting with her normal form, which is pretty weak and primarily there to build up your Warrior Gauge so that you can convert that Warrior Gauge into her Awakening Gauge which will allow her to transform. It's overall a satisfying moveset to utilize, not only because of how much damage she can do in her dragon form, which is a lot, but how it actually contrasts with her normal mode, which makes building up to that damage to be worthwhile and satisfying. So yeah, Tiki is a pretty great character as far as moveset is concerned, but the other character moveset is also a lot of fun and distinct. One such example is looking at Xander and Frederick's combat style. Xander has a very acrobatic and mobile combat style that revolves around mounted combat, while Frederick on the other hand have horse combat that handles like you're riding a very mobile but heavy mount, with Frederick using the momentum from his horse in his combos. Both playstyles revolve around horse combat and mobility, but also feel very distinct from each other, with their playstyle really do fitting the weapons they wield. Another example is comparing Lin and Chrom's swordsmanship, where one also feel more mobile, while the other is more personal in your face, with you being able to see that Lin has the more ideal movesets that's able to deal with crowds, but lacking the dual department with how mobile she is and how awkward her moveset is in terms of juggling a single target, especially her C4, which is pretty damn important since most characters C4 exposes stun gauge, and she can't really juggle well with her C4, while Krom on the other hand is more dual focused, better than Lin I say, why his crowd control is nowhere near Lin's level, cause Lin's crowd control is pretty insane. The game overall does a great job of making the movesets feel like the character is a force of destruction, as well as giving each moveset its own identity. The movesets themselves are simple to utilize, well this is a warrior's game, but still fun to pull off due to that force of destruction part I mentioned. There's also no major stinkers in the moveset department, like in some of the other warrior's title, which is a good thing. Add in how each character stats add some uniqueness to how they are used, and you got a decent amount of diverse characters to play around with. So are there any possible problems to the character moveset in this game? Well there is one, which is clone movesets. Yeah unfortunately Fire Emblem Warriors have a decent amount of characters that share the same moveset. That alone is already disappointing, but what's even more egregious is that certain weapon types only have one moveset to them, which are the Archer and Lancers. Even the characters who use this home has got like two different movesets to them, which are Robin and Leo slash Elise. Yeah it sucks that Leo and Elise share a moveset too, especially with how there's only 3 magic users in this game, but at least you can alternate between them if you want to use the magic user and want some variety. 
but for lancers, archers, there's only one moveset for each of them, so it can get pretty boring using those type of units since they all basically play the same. Especially so if you want to have a balanced team set of weapon types due to the weapon triangle, so like you want to try to get a lance unit every time. Though it's not too big of an issue, since there are ways to have a surrogate lance unit if you get tired of using the Pegasus Knight's moveset via having other units via weapons that reverse the weapon triangle, aka reaver weapons, having weapons that does effective damage against certain units, and etc. So in terms of the weapon triangle, it's not that big of an issue since there are ways to have non-lance unit to actually function like a lance unit, well in the context of the weapon triangle system. But as far as movesets are concerned, it's still disappointing that the only lance units you can actually use are just Pegasus Knights. This is disappointing because I think they could have done some pretty good movesets with lances in this game and expand the variety of movesets that's available. Especially considering the fact that Koal aren't strangers to making movesets that revolves around lances. Oh, Jeryu and Yukimura! Now I know they sort of fixed this problem with the Fates DLC with both Azora and Oboro moveset, but like I said, I'm judging this game without the DLC. But overall, the clone movesets are a downer in this game, especially with how there's a decent amount of characters that are clones, and it does hurt the game. Now, this problem doesn't destroy the game since the movesets themselves are still fun and varied enough to play around with, and it's not like this is the worst case of clone movesets in Warriors history, aka Dynasty Warriors 6, but it does put a damper on things. Now, the last thing I talk about in regards to the combat is the level design. Now, level design wise, I say it's okay. I think the level design does provide a decent amount of variety of battles for both the main story and history mode. Main story mode in particular has some pretty decent level design since I think they do a good job at making each map feel like its own thing, especially chapter 12 where I think it does a great job of making you have to be somewhat proficient at managing your entire party member in order to do the mission successfully. But history mode is another story. Now to history mode's credit, there is a variety of mission types in there so it doesn't feel like you're doing the same thing over and over again. The thing is that the same mission types do feel samey. Like one shadow elimination mission in the Fates history map feels very similar to another shadow elimination mission in the Blazing Sword history map. The difference is just that one has a higher level. Now the level design itself isn't bad. It does a decent job of making each mission type feel distinct and how you progress each map is decently executed with there not only being a massive amount of enemies for you to enjoy the combat mechanics to its fullest, but there's also a bunch of side objectives and main objectives for you to accomplish so you always feel like you're striving towards something, which not only allow the SRPG like character ordering mechanics to shine, but also give the map a good progression curve. It's overall not great level design, but it works well enough for what the game is going for. The only problem is that the same mission types do feel a bit samey. Overall, I have to say the combat is actually really well executed. They managed to combine elements from both series and managed to create a pretty fun experience around those elements. It's surprising how well the Fire Emblem inspired mechanics and Warrior mechanics actually complement each other to make a distinct but fun Warriors title. It's obvious that a lot of thought went into the gameplay of Fire Emblem Warriors and I just have to commend the developers for that. It's not perfect, but combat wise, Fire Emblem Warriors is a whole lot better than I thought it was going to be. Now it's not a game for everyone still since it still plays like a Warriors game, and if you don't like Warriors gameplay, which is namely going around slicing dicing from numerous enemies with over the top combat, with the emphasis being on feeling like a force of destruction, with the challenge of these games mostly stemming on not fighting the enemy itself but on how to maneuver through the map and achieving the various objectives on those maps so you can achieve victory, while also making sure that your main base or commander isn't downed. So yeah, if you don't like this type of gameplay, then this game isn't going to change your mind. But if you do like Warriors gameplay, and you're also a Fire Emblem fan, you might just be surprised how well implemented the mechanics are when combining the two. Oh yeah, there's one thing I forgot to mention. And this is probably a big problem to the game, and that is the crashes that happen. Now I'm not sure if this problem is fixed now, but when I first played through it, I did experience a few crashes when I was playing in performance mode. So yeah, that's a problem. Now it didn't occur enough to destroy the game, and the maps are short enough that you only lose probably half an hour or an hour of progress, 
but it's still pretty annoying when the game crashes. Now let's briefly talk about the progression system that Fire Emblem Warrior has. Now in terms of progression system, Fire Emblem Warrior got three main ones which are namely the leveling system, the crest system, and weapon forging. Now the leveling system is pretty simple. You basically get experience whether from battle or using gold, and when you get enough, your character will level up where their stats will increase and it's done in Fire Emblem style. Now for you Fire Emblem fans wondering, stats gained through leveling is set, no RNG involved. Now let's talk about the crest system which is probably the progression system that has the most significance. Now the crest system is basically like a skill tree that each character has, with you unlocking various moves, skills, and stat bonuses within these skill trees, with materials you get from battle. The ability to promote is also locked within the crest system, with you needing to be at a certain level and getting a master seal. With the benefit of promoting is not only getting substantial stat bonuses, but you also unlock more of the skill tree. Well, the most important of those is probably unlocking more moves. Skills are also in this game, which are namely powerful passive abilities that grant the users certain bonuses that are activated when certain conditions are met or they're just flat bonuses that are active all the time. It really depends on the skill, though the skills that are activated when certain conditions are met are notably pretty powerful, with each character having their own personal skill. But you are able to get other characters personal skills if you're able to get the support bond of those characters and the characters you're playing as to a certain rank, as well as getting certain materials. Lastly, let's talk about weapon forging. It's a pretty simple system with you being able to customize the weapon you get from battle with powerful traits, though to a certain degree, with that degree depending on how many weapon slots you have. These traits can range from something minor like upgrading a certain move in your moveset to something much more substantial like traits that can let you reverse the weapon triangle, change a character whose main damage modifier was strength to being magical attacks now, weapon treats that allow you to do a lot of damage to a certain enemy type like dragon killer or horse killers, though at the cost of the strength of the weapon, and etc. But the main way of getting traits to a weapon is by transferring a skill from another weapon to the weapon you want to use, with the cost being is the support weapon, aka the weapon that you're transferring a skill from. There are also certain weapon traits that are locked that you need to unlock by using that weapon to defeat a certain number of enemies, as well as using gold. Overall, I think the progression system works well enough in terms of providing a good feeling of progression as you play through the game, whether you be getting stats for leveling up or using the crest system to get more moves, unlocking skills and promoting, you really do feel like your character is getting substantially stronger using those two systems. The four systems are also pretty well done with it allowing you to have a pretty good range of customization in how your weapon can function, which really gives a good array of options on how you can use your unit. This and the skill system really does allow you to have a decent amount of customization in how you may want to build up your character to a certain degree, especially with how you can equip a variety of skills for each character and how impactful these skills can be, and the right skill combination just allow you to simply bulldoze through the opposition, well even more so than normal which can be satisfying though you have to grind a lot to get the skills you want. I also really like the various ways you can raise up your unit without even using them. The ease of use of raising up your units really does allow you to get into the fun part of the game much faster when trying out new characters, with there still being incentive to using other characters via increasing support bond and skill building as well as using their movesets which I think is overall a good thing. It never felt cheap to raise your units this way as well since you have to use the resources you earn in battle you don't simply get a free level up card. If there was one complaint I had, I do wish there was like a glossary section that details on what type of drops each enemy type have, just so you know where to grind for certain materials when you want to unlock certain nodes in the crest market. Though at the very least, the game still does give you a good idea on where to get the more important materials like master seals from just seeing the reward section in the mission description of each history and story mode map with it letting you know what battles you have to do to get these important materials. Overall, it's hard to read Fire Emblem Warriors as a crossover game. In one hand, it only represents 3 games out of 12 original games within the Fire Emblem series again excluding the remix, which is a low number of representation, but on the other hand, it manages to introduce Fire Emblem-like mechanics into the Warriors formula, and actually managed to implement them in a way that complement the combat, 
which overall add a lot to the gameplay. You get to see characters from different games interact with each other to create enjoyable interactions. But the story is also pretty bad, with it having underdeveloped main characters and setting, with the story not doing much to make it stand out to other crossover stories. Each character moveset in this game is a lot of fun to play around with in the context of a warrior's title, but there's also clone moveset in this game that drags down the experience. In the end, I can see why some fans are iffy about this game. There are problems that this game has as a crossover title. If you were to ask me if it's a good warrior's title, I would say, hell yeah! It's a whole lot of fun. The pro far outweighs the cons as long as you're a warrior's fan. It just has this context of a crossover title that makes it hard to judge, especially if you've been a fan of the Fire Emblem series way before the 3DS Fire Emblem games. But if you were to ask me if I like this game as a crossover game, I would have to still say yes. It just does so many things right for me, the gameplay implementation, the cute way of how they retold certain story scenarios with the current cast in history mode, with it being a cute easter egg, how history mode played tribute to the game it represents with not only the cute reenactments, but also having the sound effect and map visual design from specific games in the Fire Emblem series. How some of the support combos are nice to see, and etc. I just had so much fun with this game. To say otherwise would just be lying. Yes, it sucks that this game doesn't have more representation, but when I just see how well implemented the Fire Emblem mechanics are in this game, I just can't help but really like this game, not only as a Warriors fan, but as well as a Fire Emblem fan. Like someone just hit the jackpot. To wrap it, you greedy little dog. <gasps> Finders keep. Oh no, you don't. Come back here. Nope, not going that way. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>